What about these people in today's day and age that are beguiled? They listen to pastor so-and-so on TV. Pastor so-and-so, all pastor so-and-so wants is more money. Pastor so-and-so may not have a burden for your soul, doesn't know who you are, doesn't care one bit, but send the money. Keep sending the money. Now, again, please distinguish between the need that the church will always have and your stewardship responsibility versus those people that have abused and corrupted the desires that are contained in this book that are God's express will for humankind. I want to show God's fidelity in the way sometimes we understand passages that can directly affect the bigger picture. So I'd like you, if you have a Bible and if you are able to open it to 2 second, second Peter, 2nd second chapter. There were certain, or there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. Now remember, with the day and age in which Peter is writing, and I'm going to say most assuredly, this writing would come no later than 30 years, and that's pretty far out. No later than 30 years, and that's a far date. It's probably earlier than that, after Christ's ascension. And I put this as actually earlier than that, but I'm saying at the, at the extreme that there were people that crept in, he says, as the false, there were false prophets among the people in those days, in, in the old times, which the prophets themselves in the Old Testament spoke about. People who would say, I have a word from the Lord, but it was just whatever. So he says also, there'll, there'll be false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Now you may be asking, why am I in this chapter? Because I'm talking about heaven and hell. Hold that thought for a second. I, I think I will answer the question as I go, so stay with me. First thing I want to tell you is, we, I think when we talk, we, we discuss judgment, the judgment of God, we tend to not think first and foremost about the teachers. We tend to think about the flock. But you've got to start somewhere and work your way down. Every leader, including me, I'm no different than you. I'm a sinner being saved by grace. I have received just as you have. And the only thing that separates me and you is I was called to do this thing. And as most of you know, in a public way, I did not ask for this. I didn't volunteer for this. So I did answer the call of God. And um, there is no one that is immune from this. But let's start at the top. Why does Peter talk about these false teachers? And he says, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. He says, theirs is going to come. And this is why when people ask me about, what about these people that you see on TV? They're nothing but a bunch of charlatans. What about the guy who only wants to talk to you about uh, emergency food supplies? Well, he'll get his. What about the woman who's always talking about, it's every, every program. I don't care what program you listen to. Every program is about how much money and there's always a set amount. It's if you don't send that $300 right now, you're going to hell. I, I don't understand. I've said to you, giving is intrinsic to Christianity, but this type of uh, greed, this type of drive, without explanation, by the way, without explaining to people, the church will always have a need. We have needs as creatures. God to be God has no needs. We have needs. And this functions just exactly like anything else in that same frame of reference, having needs. However, you cannot start improvising on how to, essentially doing or running a church like a business under the guise that it's a church, but using the tactics of the world that will never work, it will never enrich anybody's life. 
it's never going to help anybody to grow spiritually. And the biggest issue that I read in here is when it says, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not, it means theirs is coming. And it may not be here and now, but it's going to come. Well, what happens to the people then who are participating in these ministries? Hear me out. If you didn't take the time in your lifetime to check out the instructions you were being given spiritually, oh, let me say it another way, and in the flesh so we all understand, you know, would you engage in a health uh, regimen without inquiring what exactly is needed of you and what you have to do and what is the end goal? So you also wouldn't take one person's advice. You'd probably get multiple opinions. Here we have something very important being given as an instruction, and that is if the Word of God, Paul says it in Thessalonians, is not being rightly divided, Oh, there'll be people in ignorance who follow because they don't know any better, but you still are not going to be released of your ignorance because you have a responsibility. Friends, I know this is really hard to hear, but once you have heard, in fact, the book of Hebrews talks about it, Peter talks about it, Paul talks about it, and most importantly, Jesus talks about it. Once you've heard, you have an excuse when you haven't heard. You can say, oh, gee, I didn't know that. But once you come to know, you have a real problem. And the real problem is what Paul will talk about, which I will probably touch on next week. You are without excuse, he says, handling or receiving the things of God but treating it as if not, or essentially handling the things of God as if it's just like everything else. And Paul says you are without excuse. He calls this type of behavior just as wicked and unrighteous and ungodly as what people would la label as blatant sinners doing blatant deeds. Now, I have made my goal for this ministry to be a message of grace, and I have done that. I have said to you I've never preached on social issues, but this teaching is part of the Bible, and it's my responsibility, as I said last week, to point these things out, because if I don't, if I choose to not discuss them because they're hard to hear, they're not very palatable, they're not pleasant, but if I choose to go around them and not discuss them, I too am put in the same category as false teachers, not just because they pervert or they caricature, but omitting something is just as bad. And I am going to say, listen, maybe I didn't conduct my ministry perfectly, Maybe I didn't do a lot of things perfectly or right, but one thing I will not be accused of and I will not stand guilty for is not preaching the whole counsel of God to you and explaining it so we can say together, we understand this. Now the judgment part comes in, and I want us to read this with a right frame of reference. Verse 4 begins, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and deliver them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Let's stop right there. And I want to look at this very carefully. These are examples of God's judgment in the past. Now, the angels, the angels are not born. The angels are created. And when it says that God spared not the angels that sinned, there's a great debate about whether Peter is talking about the first fall, that is where Satan took a third of heaven with him, or whether, as some believe, the angels that sinned, referring to that passage out of Genesis where it says that these giants mated with the women of the earth, but I prefer to believe that it is meant in the original and first form of Lucifer taking a third of heaven with him when he fell. Now, it says, if God spared not the angels, their condition, I want you to write some notes somewhere in your margin, their condition. And I'm going to reverse the words, but they mean the same thing, not spared. Angels created by God, not spared. I'm hoping this is going to hit home because there's too many people that think about this and it's in such a caricatured way that there's absolutely no 
There should be a healthy fear of God that's healthy. But for some people, there's absolutely no fear whatsoever at all. And I can't think that that's even normal. So if God spared not the angels, that's their condition. The angels were not exempt is what I'm saying. And we can talk of the angels as divine created beings. So if they were not exempt, why should we think we would be? He cast them down to hell. That Greek word there, I think I told you I would talk about this. It is, in the Greek, there is a term that's used for words that are only used once, hapex legomenon. That word for hell being used here is the Greek word tartarus. And if you look up the word, because most of the words being used are Hades, which I've described as the unseen world, Gehenna, the place of burning, and Tartarus. And this is, it's so very unique that this word is used only one time in the New Testament by Peter. And the essence of this word is tapped into Greek mythology. That is, it was believed that if Hades is the unseen world, Tartarus lays below the unseen world in a place where people remain trapped and punished forever. Now, again, uh, mythology sometimes, we, we do forget that sometimes mythology may have taken from, or maybe we took from mythology. That's why you have to do the research. But the reason why I bring this up is because there's a lot of uh, potential information in these verses that can give us great insight into other areas of the Bible, which I'm not teaching on today, unfortunately. <laughs> But what it does say here about these, that God did not withhold punishment, that there is essentially an incarceration of these kind until judgment will be meted out on them permanently, because it says to be reserved unto judgment. That is definitely a permanent future judgment as well. Now notice the words reoccurring again. For if God spared not the angels and spared not the old world, speaking of the, he's going to speak of, but save Noah, the antediluvians. And this is also an interesting uh, topic here. But spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of, of the ungodly. Now let's stop there and let's talk about this for a second because what we're going to be looking at is we looked at kind of this divine, uh, we'll call it unrighteousness, uh, divine ungodliness. And there's something very important that the angels didn't listen to God, they listened to Lucifer. And you're going to, you're going to find there are some reoccurring themes. This will be one of them not being able to recognize what in future verses the word will be dominion. And I'm going to talk on this in a minute as well. So some people ask, well, it says Noah was a preacher of righteousness. How does Peter get to this? And I've said, just like Jude, I've said there is no doubt in my mind that uh, both Jude and Peter would have been acquainted with, with the book of Enoch. In the Book of Enoch and other apocryphal writing, we glean information such as that the ark was 120 years in the making. That's a long time. And we also glean some information when it says preacher of righteousness. You know, if you're just reading the Bible, the only thing we know about Noah is that he was drunk and he was naked. That's, I mean, he built the ark, he was drunk, he was naked. These are the things that, I mean, we know more, but these are the bullet points, if you will. So it's important to put a footnote here to say, I am certain that with the many different apocryphal writings that speak of this, there's no doubt in my mind that as Noah began to build the ark in preparation for rain, and the likes the earth had never seen, had never seen before as such, and I'm sure that the individuals that mocked you know, what, what stupidity, what foolishness. Why would you build an ark when uh, there's, there's no water, there's no rain, we haven't even seen rain. And so it's kind of interesting 
that they call him a preacher of righteousness, but I imagine in the years that he was building the ark and whether he had help from his sons or not, maybe that's why it took 120 years, but um, what I was going to say to you is that it, it's quite apparent that in only the way that Noah could, although we don't have a clear record of it, he must have been preaching to people a very simple message. God is going to pour out judgment. And if it was in the very uh, simplistic way of saying it, he was probably calling the people of the then known world to turn back to God. So he's called a preacher of righteousness. But it's important to note something. When we just read the Bible, we might say, well, that's not righteous behavior, that he was drunk and naked and one of his sons uh, wanted to maybe make a spectacle of his nakedness while the two other sons turned their backs and covered him up as to cover his nakedness, to respect their father. So then it turns to, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. So we have the angels and God's judgment upon them, Noah and the deliverance that God brought to Noah and the judgment that he brought upon the earth to those who would not listen. Remember, dominion, authority, the proclamation of some message from God that is not being attended to. And the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. And I have to read this in, in a whole section because it's all part of one thought. And delivered just Lot, because it was Lot that was in Sodom and Gomorrah, delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation or behavior of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. And then it says, The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve uh, the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. So let me talk about this because, again, it's giving another example. So if we were examining Lot out of Genesis, we would probably not call Lot righteous. Would you agree with that? Based on what we know, okay? A hanger-on. Uh, let's just kind of recap a little bit for people who might not be familiar uh, that Lot was traveling the, the barnacle hanger on to Abraham. And basically, when their cattle and all the blessings of God began to make it so that the land couldn't basically hold both of them, uh, there's a, essentially here, you, because we can't all stay together, there's too much strife, pick where you'd like to go. And of course, Lot, in his mind, he's, he's going to pick what he deems as the best. You've got uh, Abraham. God speaks to him and says, lift up now thine eyes from the place where you're at and wherever you look, everything where the sole of your feet touches shall be yours. But Lot ventures off and Lot was, to, to Abraham, Lot was a pain in the derriere, so to speak. Um, so we would not interpret, reading what we know about Lot from the Old Testament, we would not interpret Lot as a righteous man. But that's actually a blessing for us and I'll explain but to the religious rabbis who would look at Lot uh, looking backwards, a lot of the Midrash, a lot of the commentaries on Genesis, and looking from the eyes of people who were, because the law was not yet, the law had not yet been given in Lot's day, but looking through the eyes of people who were living later and looking through the lens of the law and looking backward, although there was no law in that day, it's interesting that you would look at Lot and you would say, Lot probably was the chiefest of sinners in that realm if, if they were looking at it through the lenses of the law, but the law was not yet. So we can only read what we know about Lot. And if you don't know the story about Lot, you really should go back to Genesis and read it. It's kind of an interesting uh, chapter. But what is being said here is so vitally important for us because I want to take away something that may, some of you may be really nervous listening to me. Because you might say, well, wait a minute. You just said Noah was, uh, he, he enjoyed alcohol, got drunk, and certainly crashed out naked. You got Lot, who did a lot of things that he shouldn't have done, and that was a pun. Uh, 
so how is God going to look at me? And this is what I want to tell you. See, because there's a real distinction between when it says ungodly, unrighteous, godly, righteous, just. It's actually a great message of grace wrapped up inside these few verses because God is not looking for you to be perfect. He knows your frame. He knows my frame. So if God delivered Noah and his family, and if God delivered Lot, and Lot and his wife, by the way, would have made it out, except she turned back, and it says that she turned into a pillar of salt. She might have just been a salty gal to begin with. But what I'm saying to you is it's important for us to look at these chapters, or these verses rather, and say, you know, it could be scary if we're talking about judgment, but when we recognize that the people that God saved, they weren't perfect and they were sinners. The people that God saved in these passages, these few, what I'm highlighting, they were not the poster children for the perfect saint, and yet God saved them. And they're, by virtue, I'd say to you, well, Noah is in Hebrews 11, what we call the chapter of the heroes of faith, but Lot is not there. And yet God saved Lot. So there's something that should bring to all of us a little bit of, ah, okay, God knows I'm a sinner. God knows you're a sinner. God is not standing like some cosmic killjoy pounding his stick waiting to just, you know, give it to you. But rather, I want you to look carefully at what's being said. Remember, I, I said dominion, authority. The angels were not spared. Why? They didn't listen to God. And Noah, you can say whatever you want, but Noah said, Noah was told by God, build an ark. You get these certain animals clean, whatever the instructions were, and your family, and get in and close the doors. Rain's going to flood. A deluge is going to come upon the earth. He had never seen this before, so it took an act of faith and saying, yes, sir, without question. And I mean, it, it, this is pretty important because if you never saw a flood or rain before, building an ark is stupid. But remember I said authority or dominion. Noah recognized God as God, even though he might not have understood theologically or in complexity, but he understood this is an order from God. Whereas the angels did not listen. And whereas, I'm pointing out, Lot, albeit Lot was uh, real work, in this case, even though there was a lot of reluctancy, ultimately in the end, he does end up listening. And this is what's being highlighted, not whether or not he was a good man or a just man or he lived perfectly, because he didn't. But what's important is that he heard instructions, and although in Lot's case not perfectly followed, he still heard and he still followed. And that is where the juxtaposition between these false teachers, the fallen angels. Let me keep reading now. Because verse 9 says, The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. So this is what I want to say. The Lord does know how to deliver the godly. And if you go back and you read, for example, in Noah's case, and I want, to make, I want to make sure we understand this. A lot of times people think deliverance from God will come in a miraculous fashion that is void of human help. But in fact, that is not true. And people who believe that are sorely misguided in the scriptures. Why? Because it says the Lord ha knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations. Well, let's take Noah. Noah's temptation could have been to doubt. If you've never seen a flood before, it's like me saying, I've never seen a resurrected person before, so I have to take certain things by faith. That's how it works. Noah, never having seen a flood, however, hearing that God said, this is going to happen, took at face value what God said. So when we look at Noah and his deliverance, the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation and reserve the unjust under the day of judgment, 
Well, look what happened. The flood came, and the people who were on or upon the land, uh, I'm going to say the vast majority, because the jury's not in yet, uh, whether people survived or not, and I'll, someday we'll touch on this. It's not a subject for now. But if he knows how to deliver, the deliverance may not be in some mystical, fantastic, miraculous way, but rather, Noah, build an ark. Here's the measurements. Here's what you need. Here's the wood you're going to build it out. I mean, all of these, perfect knowledge of what would stay afloat, how it would float, how it would work, who would be in it. The Lord knows how to deliver. The Lord knows how to deliver we're going to talk about Lot. Well, in this case, it had to be that Abraham had to come and plead for Lot. The Lord knows how to use everyday tools. I think sometimes we look for extreme miraculous things when God may be carrying out his mission and his work through us because that's what the church is for. Now, I'm not saying God can't act outside the church or independent of the church because he does. But if anyone just strictly thinks that the Lord knows how to deliver the, the godly out of temptations will be a, a magic wand, bring, and now you're delivered, that is a caricature. But the real reality is that the Lord can give instructions. And if we're reading those instructions, they come out of this book. And they tell me I don't have to be afraid that I'm not perfect and that I haven't lived a perfect life because neither did Noah, neither did Lot, and neither did most of the people in the chapter of the Heroes of Faith, but they did listen to what God said, and they took it as serious and as valuable and as important, and it wasn't pushed aside. It wasn't treated with disrespect or blatant disregard. In this day and age, that's what people do. Now, I'm sure of this. I'm sure because we live in a universe now where there are more people who do not believe the Bible, a very skeptical and cynical age of people who prefer to be their own God. And unfortunately, there's not a lot of... Uh, what I'm doing today is difficult for even me. I'd love to tell you, you know, here's some, something that's going to make you feel so good, you're, I'm going to have to rip you off the, the ceiling because you just floated up there. But actually, I did tell you something really great and that is God's not against you. If you're listening to me, and I'm not God, and I don't have anything except the words from this book, but if you're listening to me, God is cared, has cared and does care about you, and you matter to him. And it may be a life that's been lived, uh, like I said, I'm not perfect. Your life, certainly, like mine, not perfect. But the only thing that God's looking for, and this is the message I don't know why people are so quick to dismiss, because God's not asking for very much. Maybe if God asked for more, maybe there'd be more people to step up to the plate. But, you know, it's kind of like what Ray Sidney shared with us about the Japanese people that he teaches. He charges the people because when he went to Japan, he was going to give lessons away for free. But there, nobody in that culture, nobody wanted. They thought, well, there's something wrong if it's free. You've got to pay for it. You have to think about that for a minute. They may not actually be completely void of the knowledge of God, they just don't know it. We'll leave that alone. So the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations. The Bible also tells me that if we're reading the word of God, the saints are not exempt or immune from temptation. But the Bible does say with the temptations that we are tempted with, he provides a way of escape. He provides a door for us to go through. And each person, their temptation will be different. But there's one guarantee. He says, I'll provide a way for you. Something else that I took note of, which is that he, he rescued Lot. When it says he delivered him, uh, delivered just Lot, he, the Greek says he delivered him, uh, or rescued him, rather, out of, ek. The Greek word, a little, little particle, looks like an E and a K, ek, out of. But not apo. Apo would be that he essentially delivered him from the sense of having any trials whatsoever away from. No, God delivered him out of, and there's a radical difference. This is why people get confused when bad things happen and they think, well, how could a just God let me be in this situation? First of all, my friends, God never promised 
that you're not going to have trials. I've been saying this for 15 years. God has not promised you a perfectly uh, smooth ride. In fact, if your ride is smooth, there's probably something wrong with you. There's going to be bumps in the road, and our faith is what navigates those bumps. Nothing else. Not will worship. Oh, make it through. You'll see. So what about this? Let's, let's keep going. Because verse 10 picks up a different section. And, and what God dealt with the angels and what God dealt with, with Sodom and Gomorrah, and Sodom and Gomorrah's uh, situation is a little bit different than the angels who have been cast down to a place and reserved unto the day of when they will ultimately be punished Sodom and Gomorrah has been wiped off the map. And in this case, God didn't wait. He eradicated that place. Remember the pleading of Abraham for if there's just so many righteous persons, no, there isn't. So many less, no, there isn't. If there's just one, no, there isn't. And then therefore God basically uh, destroyed. There is judgment. Now you move to the next section in verse 10, which is referring back to the false teachers. And all of these examples that Peter is using are being used to demonstrate something bigger about what will happen to people who twist the scripture, what will happen to people who are not feeding the saints, what will happen to people who call themselves pastors, priests, rabbis, ministers, who are entrusted with this word, who then do whatever with it, and under the guise of whether it's to make money or to deceive. Essentially, these illustrations are not in here as a recap of the Old Testament. They are in here as a recap that God will not be mocked, and both in the Old and in the New Dispensation, God is looking for people that will listen to Him. He knows our frame. And that even though we may hear, we may not perfectly carry out, we may not act in faith all the time. There's a lot of things we may not do, but hearing and the desire, that doesn't mean you will achieve, but the desire to please God. I've said this now for many weeks without faith. The Bible says it's impossible to please God. That's your starting point. Now this verse 10 goes back to these false things false teachers, but chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government. And if you look in your margin for this government, dominion, but it should be understood this way, because the whole passage is kind of sifting down to one thing. Will you listen? And what are you hearing? Will you listen that when you die, it's not the end. What are you hearing? I may have just said something, and then there'll be people that will attend a funeral in the next month or two, and they will see this as the end. It's finished. Finished as in that person is gone. We'll never see them again. They're not coming back. But I've been teaching you about heaven and the reality of what is contained in this book, which is not only riveting for the thinking person, but absolutely exciting to know that if there is a judgment seat and there's a white throne judgment, it means every individual that has ever lived on the face of the earth will stand before him in another realm. It will not be in this realm. It will be in another realm, which is why I defined Hades as the unseen world. We will be in the unseen world and ultimately then in his presence to give an account and know these two things do not, the, the judgment seat and white throne do not happen at the same time but I'm putting them there to show you there will be an element for all to appear and for all to disclose and for all to make known. But the most important thing is that in this lifetime, while you were here, you will not be able to say, I didn't know. There is the important thing. Many of these people did not listen or if they heard they rejected. The angels heard. It was, God's, it was God's voice in the heavens. And Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, those chapters essentially uh, encapsulate Satan 
or Lucifer saying, I will be like God, desiring to be God and to take to usurp his throne, which lifted up in pride, then is cast down with a third of heaven going with him. Failure to listen to the authority of God's word. And I want to make it clear, I'm a teacher. I try to sometimes in hard um, pictorial words, sometimes it's in analogies. I'm just a teacher. I'm not somebody who has power over other people. People who believe that, they're nuts. And I'm not somebody who has a higher standing because I'm a pastor and somebody's a parishioner. We're all sinners. I know that many people, and I've got many listeners who come out of the Catholic tradition, such as I, and all I'd say to you is this. I said this last week, and I know I probably made a lot of people mad, but friend, I'd prefer you be mad at me now and think about what I'm saying than be caught off guard later. When you stand before God, you will stand alone. You will not stand with your husband or your wife. You will not stand with your brother or your sister. You will not stand with your priest, your pastor, your minister, your rabbi, or anyone else you considered a spiritual leader. It will be you and God. And maybe uh, uh, an audience of the heavenlies may be listening in, but certainly it'll just be you and God, you giving account. So I asked the question, is it not a good time for you in the now to build your relationship with God, seeing as you will stand before him alone? Now, you're not going to be alone forever, but in that moment when you give account, there's not going to be anyone to speak for you. And there are whole denominations that work and operate on a spokesperson speaking for other people in that faith. I cannot buy into that. Why? Because I may say to you, please pray for me. Your prayers are heard. But no one can put themselves in the place of God who is nothing but flesh and blood. Flesh and blood is always going to be flesh and blood. And what is of God, that is God, is God alone, and there is no. Sorry. I know a lot of people that are angry that I say this. There is no human appointed on earth to be the only representation of Christ. The representation, represent, sorry, representation of Christ is his church when he said, I will build my church, the outcalled ones who've responded to his call, not to a pastor, a preacher, or a priest. They have responded to him and him alone. Now, to him alone, I'm asking you to understand this passage is speaking of those who listen to God's authority and his dominion versus those that don't. Angels, you say, were cast down to hell? And they were so close to God. They were created by him. That's right. So it's important to grab hold of this. And remember, the essence of what's being said here is regarding, and there's a very graphic description of these false teachers, starting what I just read, but chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government. Presumptuous are they, self-willed, they are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Some texts um, will read a little bit differently. But we see here, starting at the last part of verse 10 all the way through verse 16, a description of these false teachers. So, whereas angels, which are greater in power and might, bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord, but these, and who are the these? The false teachers. But these, as natural brute beasts, simply speaking, if you want it, here, let me read it to you straight from the Greek. And unlike folks who say, the Greek says, I like sometimes to read Greek to you, even though most of you just say, if you're speaking Greek, <laughs> it's all Greek to me. Um, that's verse 12. The Greek reads, Utoi de os aloga zoa. These men are as irrational, aloga, without word. Log, word, aloga, without reason, without word, or irrational. They're like irrational animals, having been born by nature for capture and destruction 
in matters they are ignorant of, and it just, I mean, tells you straight out. These are people that Peter is saying, they're not even of human kind. Now, an animal is only interested in one thing, preserving itself, surviving and preserving itself, food and self-preservation. These, as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they understand not and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. But here's the thing. Remember last week I was talking about rewards? Rewards also work the other way. So the judgment seat of Christ is where rewards, not punishment, are meted out to the believer. If you don't know what I'm talking about, please go read the Gospels where it talks about certain people who, there was a certain man or there were certain people and they, it says, and they were rewarded one or their fruit or reward, 30, 60, 90, 100, but not all the same, but all had to do, by the way, with authority, dominion, listening and hearing the word of God and applying it. They all have to do with that. Verse 13 says, they shall receive or they, per they shall utterly perish in their own corruption and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to ride in the daytime. Spots they are and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. They essentially, be careful with how you interpret this because we know sporting in the Bible, in the King James, when uh, two people were sporting together, it means that they were having intercourse. Here, the essential meaning is pleasure of self, but not necessarily meant in the first use that I explained, if that makes any sense to you, because I know this is PG time here. So, spots and blemishes they are, sporting themselves, pleasuring themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery and cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls. There we go. So what about these people in today's day and age that are beguiled? They listen to Pastor so-and-so on TV, pastor so-and-so, all pastor so-and-so wants is more money. Pastor so-and-so may not have a burden for your soul, doesn't know who you are, doesn't care one bit, but send the money. Keep sending the money. Now, again, please distinguish between the need that the church will always have and your stewardship responsibility versus those people that have abused and corrupted the desires that are contained in this book that are God's express will for humankind that are following him. Beguiling unstable souls and heart they have exercised with covetous practices. Covetous practices. You want what you don't have, but you will want what others have and you'll stop at nothing to get it. Cursed children, which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosar, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but was rebuked for his iniquity. The dumbass speaking with man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. If you're not familiar with that, I suggest you go and read that passage once more. Again, refusal to listen. In this case, God was speaking to Balaam and using not only words, but signs, and again, refusing to hear and listen, refusing to acknowledge the ultimate authority of God. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with, with a tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escape from them who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same he is brought into bondage. Now remember, he's speaking about these false teachers. They are in bondage to their greed. They are in bondage to their covetousness. They are in bondage to their lies and their deception. That still exists today, by the way. Don't think that this is some archaic thing that Peter's talking about in his day. It exists in many churches. It's not something that's been eradicated and unfortunately, you know, this is what makes my life sometimes a little bit miserable. I'm thrown into the camp with the rest of the nut jobs out there. And there's no way, unless you listen to me, 
and recognize that I'm trying to teach people, be it in a series, verse by verse, from language, from history. And my burden is for people to learn, to come to a better knowledge, but the most important thing for me is for people to have a relationship, your relationship. I'm giving you the tools to build your relationship with God. You build it. You work out your own salvation, the Bible says, between you and Him. Everybody has dimensions of their life that they are not proud of. Whether it's behavioral, I mean, we could go down the list of things. And God, God is wonderful because He knows. I mean, we can deceive other people. We can't deceive God. He knows. So it's like saying, today might be a good day to really take a good look at yourself and recognize that God knows exactly what you know about you. And it might be a good day to start recognizing God's authority in your life. Now, there are people who say, well, I, you know, I, I just can't do that. They somehow make it something so difficult. But the reality is, over and over through this book, it says people who are not willing to yield. Romans 6, you, to whom ye yield yourself, that's who you're going to serve. Yield yourself to your bank account, your checkbook, your wallet, that's what you're going to serve. You yield your, to whom you yield yourself, that is what you're joined to. So think about that. We're still talking about false teachers, though, and their ultimate fate. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escape from them who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are servants of corruption. Verse 20. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than in the beginning. This comes back to judgment, and not judgment, judgment, seed of God rewards. This comes back to judgment of what will be meted out, which brings me to introduce to you the subject which I have to touch on in this series, and it's probably one of the more unpleasant ones, the wrath of God. And what I quoted out of Romans 1, which is that the wrath of God is released from heaven against all ungodliness. And there's a reason for that. You know, we can get so buffeted by what the world expects us to be or to do or to think as Christians that we can forget the most important person we should be concerned with what he thinks of us, of our behavior, of our conduct, of our lives, of how we are stewards or our stewardship. God, audience of one. I've always said, get right with God and everything else will eventually fall into place. Get right with God, your, we'll call it your checkbook of faith will be filled. But people who are using God for riches, using God for prosperity, using God for anything and everything but for the purpose of the saving of souls. And you know what I'm saying is true. I don't think that there's a person in the sound of my voice that hasn't been witness to something of what I'm describing and maybe have said to yourself, how does God let this happen? How does he let it persist and continue? Have you ever said that? Anybody? There's a probably good amount of people in here just shaking their heads, but unilaterally think everybody in this room said yes. For it had been better for them to not have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it, turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog has turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that has washed to her wallowing in the mire. Now, there's, a, there's, there's so much in here, but it's just, I would say, the richness of this is that I cannot not address this in this subject on eternity, heaven, and hell, because it is something that has been like a splinter in, under my skin for so long, because I see it. And I wonder to myself, what would happen if people stop supporting these ministries. If people were actually looking in their Bibles and reading the Word, and albeit if you don't understand, that's fine. There's plenty of tools and helps, including this ministry here and other ministries like mine. 
I can personally vouch for the teaching ministry of my, uh, one of my dearest friends and sister in the Lord in Canton, Ohio, who is faithful in handling the word. There are many pastors. I get letters, and we have many pastors that follow this ministry to be able to feed their flock. I'm grateful for that. But let it be understood, because a lot of times we automatically people assume this whole thing is being aimed at the people sitting in the pews. Well, let's start with the people in the pulpit first. Those that are delivering the Word of God that are not delivering the Word of God. Those that should be caring for souls and those that don't. And that's why I said it's foolish to not listen to what he has to say. He's speaking to us through his Word and to not listen and hear and at least consider, meditate, pray, think about what you've heard and recognize that not only are the false teachers going to be punished and they'll get theirs, but if you think about it, people who are not so perfect, when I'm talking about judgment, there are some people whose stomach just bunches up and the nerves basically probably go right up to the back of their throat with a sick feeling in their stomach like, oh God, well, where do I stand? Well, I just said, if God delivered Noah and God delivered Lot and we can go down the litany of people that he delivered, including Abraham, who was not as saintly as people would like to paint him as. He lied to God, not once but twice. I mean, can build a whole list of the liars, the cheaters, the deceivers, the dupers, the, the dummies of the Bible that God still saved and loved. They were still listening to him. They were still recognizing his authority and his dominion in their life. This is what saved them, not good works, not will wishing to do and to achieve. So what I'm saying to you today is those people will be dealt with. I think that's abundantly clear. Oh, there's other people. Peter addresses uh, in chapter 3, verse 3, knowing this, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts. They will say, you are crazy to follow this religion because we've been hearing of Christ's return. The early church expected him to come back. It was any day. Keep looking up in the sky. And when he didn't return in 20, 30, 40, 50 years, people began to say as they did at Thessalonica, where is your God? He's not coming back. Well, it, or it's already happened. Or are you so stupid that you're still listening and following this archaic religion? There have been scoffers in every age, including this age. In fact, I feel like Christianity has become a joke in part because of the people who represent it, unfortunately. My prayer for you and for me today is to take comfort, even though my message doesn't sound too comforting. Take comfort because today, like last week I said, today is a good day to reflect and think about how seriously do you take God at his word. And let me go back and digress to the flesh. A parent is giving instruction to the child. No, one time the child doesn't listen, you can say, okay. But if every time the parent gives instruction and the child does not listen as if it didn't hear a thing, at some point you as a parent, you're going to start looking at, you, you may still love your child, but you're going to be looking at your child a little bit differently. Probably filled with some resentment, some anger, some wrath that this child is not listening and for his good or her good, but will not listen. Then take those same thoughts and place them towards God, but magnify it a million times. It grieves God to the core that in this day and age, people are still doing the same thing. And we are, unlike those in Paul's day, we are without excuse. We have a written record, which is not a fantasy, mythological, made-up collage of some precious good little stories that we can cherry-pick and see the good morals in them, but they are the Word of God giving us instruction not only on how to make it in, but what we will be like, what we will have, who we will know, where we will permanently live after this life is over. The Bible talks about and Peter talks about it. So maybe some of you thought I was going to talk about that today, the new heavens and new earth. I told you I have so much content to deliver on this subject, but today I want to make sure we end on this footnote. Maybe, maybe, this message will get under the skin of some of those who pervert 
corrupt and twist the scripture to mislead people. Maybe it won't. But for those who are listening to me, what it will do is hopefully reinforce a concept that is vitally important. Without listening and hearing, taking in and making it at least something that you think about, it's basically discounting, dismissing, and on to the next. I don't even have to think about it. Five minutes after I'm done, there will be people. Five minutes after I say that's my message, and after they tune off their device, however they're listening, they'll just go about their business, maybe get a sandwich and get a cup of coffee and go about their day, and it'll have no more impact on them as if I said, look, there's a bird flying in the sky. But there'll be other people who have heard what I've said who recognize today's a good day because it tells me that God's not against me. If he saved a person like Lot and knew how to deliver him out of his situation, he can deliver me out of mine and you out of yours and deliver me safely to stand in front of him at that day, not in a place of judgment that decides whether I'm going to heaven or hell. That's already been settled when I said I trust him. And as long as I keep trusting him, that's, that is my way in. I believe him, I trust him, he is my Lord and Savior. But he's also going to show me through this word that I keep teaching, not only how to make it there, but what am I going to do there and what my, my interreactions with him will be. And all of these things should be something we all think about if we believe that it doesn't end here. So for those people who don't, I'm just going to say this one thing which I've said many times before. We shall see. And if I am right on what I'm saying, this is not, I'm not giving you an educated guess, I'm teaching you God's word, but if I'm right, there's a whole lot of people that are going to be really happy. And if I'm wrong, which I'm not, because it's not my opinion, it's from this book, well, I'll leave that to your discretion to finish the sentence. In any event, it's my prayer that people start looking at what happens beyond the grave in a new light, in a way that says, I'm not afraid. Yes, whenever that time is, I know it will be a time of mourning. It will be a time for people around me, the people, and there may be only one person in this whole world that says, I love that person, speaking of me or whoever it is in your life. But that mourning will be turned into joy. That is a promise, by the way, in my Bible, because I know in whom I have believed and I know that he is able to bring all of this to completion and fruition to the day he has promised to me and he has promised to you to be in his presence forever. Not a bad thing, I think. So kind of seems like it would be worth our while to listen, hear, and at least contemplate what's being said and then smile because you know that God, for whatever the reason, reached down into time and touched you because you're listening to the Word of God. You're, this is not me and my words. This is the Word of God speaking to your heart. So there must be something going on in your life as well as mine that says God does love us. So I want to reciprocate in saying, I hear you loud and clear. I hope you do too. That's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.